Well, you know, um, okay, I have a confession to make. Eileen and I have had this foundational theological schism uh, since uh, as long as we've known each other. Uh, and, and I have a doctorate in theology, so she ought to just go along with what I say. <laughs> What's the chances of that happening? <laughs> Not much. So um, anyway, here's our basic uh, division. And perhaps we've talked about it before. She believes with all her heart and actually acts on this that you should pray for parking spaces. <laughs> I believe, I believe, with all of my vast knowledge of theology and the nature of God, I believe we should save the big stuff for prayer, right, and handle everything else. You know, get your own dang parking space. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and so the way this plays out is we're going somewhere, and I see a spot, and I pull into it, and then she won't get out of the car. It's like, why did you park here? Because there was an empty space. <laughs> and we can walk the rest of the way. And she goes, but I've been praying for a parking space. There's just, if we just go on up front closer, you know. So I, I get out of the car. We're walking along. And, you know, this is the part I hate. Every time, you know, we get up by the first couple of spaces and there's an empty one. And she goes... That's the one the Lord was saving for us because I've been praying for it. <laughs> now I know it wouldn't have been there had I driven up there, but you can't prove that to her. <laughs> so she just thinks she's right. And, uh, and so I thought, you know, I'm not very teachable. Uh, but we've been looking at uh, Matthew chapter 6 and looking at the, the Lord's Prayer. And uh, let me uh, share a little bit here. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. This then is how you ought to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. So Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us uh, how to pray and uh, <coughs> ask you for our daily bread. And help us to see you involved in our life in, in new and uh, important ways. Amen. So, I realized as we come to this week in the Lord's Prayer and this uh, praying for the daily bread thing, that... Um, I suddenly had this feeling that God wanted to teach me something. And I had a suspicion that it had to do with, why don't you listen to your wife? You know, just, just say them, you know. And, uh, and so, basically, in effect, what Jesus is saying is, when you, when you pray, uh, first of all, acknowledge there's a relationship with God. There's a personal relationship, and, and we're not praying to ourselves that God's different from us. We talked about that, and uh, and that God has a, a holiness uh, uh, that that's different from us. And then we talked about God's rule, the kingdom, where that it would that God's rule and presence and influence uh, and character would would permeate uh, our world in the same way that it permeates uh, heaven on earth. Is and that God's will, his intention for us, his desire for us, that that would also uh, take place here where we live. And we don't have to wait for something down the road. But now we get to this part of the prayer, which kind of bugs me a little bit, because what it seems to be saying is that we need to come to God with some of our basic uh, needs, our necessities, the details of our life, and we ought to do that on a daily basis. And uh, I'm thinking, where's the big stuff? Where, you know, Jesus teaches to pray about the big things, you know, the big issues in life, the big, and instead he says, give us today what, what you said you, you provide for us. Give us today what, what we need today. Uh, 
give us today our, our daily bread. Well, is it true that God cares about the details of our life? Is that true? Or does, does God only care about big cosmic issues, God-like issues, you know? Well, it seems to me that Jesus is saying it's totally in the details. And that goes against my instincts. For take, I want to take care of life myself, okay? I, I just want to, I'll handle that order when there's something big enough, I'll bring you in on it. I'll let you know that you can act now because... But I'll take care of everything else. And, and God says, you know, I'm so bored waiting for West Ball to let go of control. I am so bored sitting around wondering when he's going to take his hands off every detail of his life and everybody else's life around him and let me get involved. See? And I don't want to bore God, so I thought I better, I better come to grips with this. And so... Um, I started thinking, are there ways that we've pushed God out of our daily lives? Is that what we've done? Saying, we don't want to bother him, don't want to bother him, you know, want to, you know, set him free to deal with others. So I'll just manage. And uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, German theologians, Helmut Tillichy, who would name their baby that? <laughs> I want to read what he says here because this, is, uh, this really struck me. But just imagine, he says, that Jesus has forbidden us to relate all these things to our Father in Heaven and talk about them to Him. Simply forbidden it because they're too trivial for Him. See? Imagine that. Even though they mean so much to us. Imagine that Jesus had commanded us to speak to Him only about the big things. Like the kingdom of God and uh, the world dominion of Christ and the resurrection of the dead and perhaps a few other world historical perspectives that open up in any assessment of the present total situation. If that were so, would we not be left terribly alone? Would not this simply leave the greatest part of our lives fatherless? left to itself and relegated to cold loneliness, then God would really be ruled out of our everyday life and only a very small sector of our life would be considered worthy for God to dwell in. We'd all be orphans, if that were so. Only in our Sunday best and with scrubbed and shining faces could we dare to pay an occasional visit to our heavenly stepfather. Hiding our calloused hands and lines of care on our faces, then we should have to conceal from him all the little joys and sorrows of our life only to find ourselves in the next moment terribly forlorn and alone again as soon as we're outside the stepfather's audience chamber and everyday life came flooding back on us. And he says this, thank God it isn't so. Thank God it isn't so. We do not have a Sunday stepfather, but... Thank God that this father is so compassionate and realistic that he appraises all the little things in our life, exactly the same value that we actually have in our life. Thank God that he accepts us just as we are, as living people with great dreams perhaps, and sometimes even with great ideas and achievements, but also with many little desires and fears, and with hungers and weariness, and a thousand and one pettinesses and pinpricks of life that fill even the lives of the great people. Thank God that we don't have a Sunday stepfather. That we have to go and pretend everything's great and look good for and uh, present ourselves and hide away that set us worrying and, and, and that we don't want to bother him with those things. And you know what he says? The result is loneliness. Because we only, only share the big things. We only let him in on the on the important things, and uh, we, we live our life alone. And when you pray, you say, Lord, today, give to us what you promised you would do. Do in us today what you said you'd do. Provide for us today 
what you've already committed to providing for us today. That's basically the prayer. It's too simple. It's too practical. It's too detailed. And yet, I think Jesus is saying this is a way to invite God into all the details of our life. It's the way to keep from holding him at a distance. And it's really acknowledging that every day we need, uh, we need him. Now, um, there's another part of this, is, and that is, that I don't know about your translation, if you looked at this, but uh, for years, I kind of took this. I said the right words when we do the memorize, you know, and read it, you know, during the prayer time. I said the words right, but in my mind, I translated it differently. It was, give me today my daily bread. Really, isn't that more personal? Give me today my daily And then I looked at it, and I went, Oh, Westfall, that's not what Jesus said. Give us. What's that mean? Well, in the, uh, in the Hebrew mindset, uh, there was no prayer apart from the community. You didn't pray for your daily bread and then say, Thank you, Lord. I got what I need. I'm out of here. See ya. That wasn't the prayer. It was, it was thinking about the people in our lives and thinking about the community and asking God's blessing every day for all of us together. Now, how does that make a difference? What is that, what's the change in that? Here's the deal. If we pray, give us today our daily bread instead of give me, okay? If we pray, give us. The difference is, what that means is that we can only pray this looking around at the folks around us. And that means that as God takes care of us, we are looking around and realizing suddenly we're part of the answer to other people's prayer. We're not a bunch of individuals saying, God, take care of me, then I'm out of here. Okay, I'll leave those others. You can handle them if you want. Uh, it doesn't take care of me. We're not doing that. We're, we're in this together. So when we're blessed, we're all blessed. And, and, and when somebody's hurting, then we're all hurting. And so there, there is no I in team. Coach taught me that. <laughs> Coach Stone. There's a, but he also taught me that there is an I an idiot. So, you know, <laughs> two of them actually. <laughs> But uh, it suddenly shifts our, our attention away from just my stuff to our stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and we look for God's blessing and care, and we believe in it for all of us. That's a, that's a big difference. Now, um, in, uh, in, in the book, Getting Past What You Never Get Over It, since many of you don't read, I'll just, uh, there's a story in there that actually is true, and I wanted to share it today because it fits into this, and that was years ago when I did a sabbatical in Bavaria, and I rented that farm up in the hills, and I figured I could handle the language issues because I went to Costco and got the Speak German program with a little dial on it, you know, you kind of put it in the computer and it tells you your accent's really good or not so, and uh, and I'd work all morning on it, then I'd go into town, and you have to go to, you know, the cheese store, and the bakery, and the meat store, and the, you know, everything. Why not just put them all together? I have a Walmart, you know, but <laughs> then every little store, you know, and you make the rounds, and they, no kidding, they thought I was really slow. <laughs> they thought I was a burden to the family. Uh, he can't answer the most simple questions, yet he smiles a lot, you know. But, uh, I created a problem in the towns, maybe, you know. Um, I would go in and they had this fabulous bakery that it just had all this stuff, you know. Um, and I was from California at the time, you know, Johnny, California. And so I would buy up all this stuff and then I'd, I'd drive up to the farmhouse where I'm alone and, uh, you know, I'd be great. I'd live large. And then, um, 
it gets stale a couple hours and stuff, and I'd throw it out, and after a while I'd go back and get more. And, and they kept getting more and more aggressively angry at me as I'd walk into the store each time. <laughs> This was going on for a while, and uh, and they were they were just turning hostile on me. I thought, what's wrong with you? They, they hate Americans. What's wrong with these people? Sure, my Costco German isn't that good, but you know. And uh, and then finally we had a talk. They they wanted to have a little talk with me about how I was destroying the village. The that man on the hill. That's the way they described me. Uh, I would come down and buy all this stuff because for. Decades and decades, they had known exactly how much to cook of anything for everybody in the village. They knew if there was a celebration and, or if somebody was having a party and they'd cook special for them or if there was an event happening. And so they took care of the needs of the whole village. I'd walk in, buy up a bunch of stuff, and then the regular villagers would come in and there wouldn't be anything left for them. And so nobody could depend. And then some days I didn't go in. And so they couldn't cook more for me, and then, you know, so they were, they were just exasperated that I had messed up their whole system. And I finally said, well, what do you want me to do? This is the way we shop in America. Like that really got me in good graces with them, you know. And, uh, you know, in California, you know, we do it this way. And, uh, and they said, well, here's the deal. Don't buy a loaf of bread from us. There's only you. So tell us how much you want. You want a half loaf of hog broth? Or you want a quarter of a loaf? Or do you want you want like a little slice off the end? Tell us and we'll cut it for you and sell it to you. Then there's plenty for everybody. But when you buy a whole loaf of bread, you wipe us out. Well, you know, try going into QFC and asking for a half a loaf of bread. <laughs> just break off some of that French bread and just go to the stand with, here we are, I got half of this. You know, they don't, they don't buy that there. But, uh, and I realized they, their whole village was based on, you come in every day. And, and when you're done here getting your bread, then you go uh, and you get your cheese next door and you talk to them and you share your life and they ask how it's going and how's it happening at work and with their grandchildren. And, and then you go down to the, every little store and you talk and you visit and it's and it's part of sharing your life i screwed it up for everyone the same thing happens in our spiritual lives in our relationship with god you know i want to come in on a sunday and get fed from God's word, I want a good message. You know, well, you know, I got me, but uh, if I had a, a good message, yeah. and then um, and, and that ought to last me all week. I'll just store it up, you know. I'll bulk up my spiritual abdominals, and uh, and that ought to get me through. Jesus is saying it's never meant to do that. It's a it's a daily one. It's a daily coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, you know what I need today. You know, I need you today. You know, I need this or that. Lord, you know. And it gives us an opportunity to check in every day. Not, well, I heard a sermon Sunday. I prayed a little in church. That ought to last me. And then we wonder uh, why we're spirits of start. Not, not you all, but you know, some might be. So, so, give us today what you said you would provide, what we need. And then, it's funny, Jesus doesn't end the chapter with this prayer. That would have been a good place to end it, wouldn't it? Don't be like all those pagans, you know, this is how you pray, and then it would kind of end and go on to something else. Do you know what he starts talking about as soon as this prayer is over? Why are you worrying about tomorrow? He goes right into that, like one sentence. And so we pray, Lord, give us today our daily bread. The whole point of that is surrender our need to worry and control tomorrow. We surrender that. And so uh, in the passage here, um,
talks about why you worry about clothes, why you worry about this and that. Uh, oh, you have little faith. Don't worry. saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. No surprise. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that a great verse to know? I think I'm going to tack that one up on the mirror. Every day has enough trouble of its own. Why bring in tomorrow's stuff to today? I think that this is profoundly important. Um, because it, it lets us know at the very core that God cares about the details of your life. He wants to be involved in them. He's committed to you. And he asks that you come and acknowledge that. Ask him to meet you at the point of your needs today. And then says, don't worry about tomorrow. Remember when the uh, uh, people of Israel were, were, they were making their journey across the wilderness with Moses, you know, following Moses, and they were griping because there's no food and everything like that. You know, blah, 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 we're going to get a new leader to take us where we need to be. And so then this manna, which, which meant literally in Hebrew, what is it? You know, it's, it, every morning it's there and they go out and they eat it. And, and if they take more than enough for that day, what happened to it? It rotted out. Yeah. Ooh, get that out of the tent. You know? and, uh, and the point was, it was impossible to save any of them. They had to step out in faith every single day and let God meet them right there. I think that's what Jesus is inviting us to do. The things that we worry about in the future, well, the statistics say that, you know, 95% of them don't happen, the things that we worry about. I think that that's probably, they're not happening because I'm worrying, so I, I handle it that way, you know, but that's probably not it. It's that we miss out on today because we're focused so much on tomorrow. You know, today I know I'm going to be on some bad adventure. Uh, tomorrow, probably be not the adventure I wanted to go on, you know. Driving around South Seattle looking for a recovery center, you know, for, for a son. And, um, and then leaving him there. I don't want to do that. But then it's like God says, hey, Westfall. He calls me Westfall. <laughs> um, that's tomorrow. And by the way, I'll take care of you. And let me take care of you today. Yeah, but what are you going to do with me tomorrow? You'll see. Yeah, but I want to know. No, you'll see. Just like my parents used to do. Are we going to do this? We'll see. Which means usually no. <laughs> but with God, it's not. It's just, I want to be involved in your life. Let me. Don't hold me away till you get something big for me to do while you go around messing with everything. Let me have it today. And let me give to you today. That's God's word to me. That's what I got to learn today. And, um, I'll let you know next week how that goes. <laughs> okay? Let's pray. Lord, uh, we do put our whole lives in your hands. The big stuff, but also, Lord, we really put the little stuff, which usually is what messes up anyway. So we ask for you to provide today what we need. Give us the courage to look around and see that we're in this together. And... Uh, and Lord, give us the courage to set aside our worry for tomorrow. Thank you for your word that doesn't leave us adrift. <laughs>